Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Krauss, an attorney and candidate for an MPH here at the School of Public Health with a concentration in law and health policy. Today we welcome Dr. Trevor Mundell, President of the Global Health Division at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Since joining the Gates Foundation in 2001, Dr. Mundell leads the Foundation's efforts in research and development in vaccines, drugs, to address major global health challenges in the developing world. These efforts harness innovations in science and technology to save lives from diseases that receive too little attention and funding, such as AIDS, malaria, pneumonia, and neglected infectious diseases. Under his leadership, the Global Health Division works in collaboration with a grantees and partners to harness global health solutions using platform technologies. Dr. Mundell brings a wealth of experience in healthcare and development to his work in global health. Before joining the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, he worked as head of the global De development at Novartis and was involved in clinical research at both Park Davis and Pfizer. As a native of South Africa, Dr. Mundell earned his bachelor's and medical degrees at the University of Witzvaterstrand in Johannesburg. He also studied mathematics, logic, and philosophy as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University and earned his PhD in mathematics at the University of Chicago. Before I turn this session over to our moderator, Dr. Diane Wirth, Richard Pearson Strong Professor of Infectious Disease and Chair of the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Trevor Mundell to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Well, Dr. Mundell, welcome and thank you very much for coming. Um, we're going to take this opportunity to have a discussion with you on leadership and on how you view um, uh, the challenges of leadership and how throughout your career you've had a um, had you've had careers in different settings you've been in academia you've been in business and now you're at the Gates Foundation and we'd like you to comment on how kind of you've prepared yourself for these leadership roles well thanks Diane uh, you, you know you're quite right in terms of the, the fairly diverse uh, circumstances from uh, the private sector uh, from academic settings to the Gates Foundation uh, but I think that there's certain commonalities to uh, to those settings uh, one is that these are all uh, political settings so I think that uh, being aware of the uh, the motivations of your stakeholders and mm -hmm. your partners and, and being sensitive to that is something which you can never forget in terms of being able to work, work the matrix that you have. And I think there's an, another thing that I've learned and as I've looked back and, and maybe it's something that's inherent or maybe it's something that people can actually uh, <clears throat> learn about which is to the extent that you perceived as being someone who is um, territorial who has a particular mission which is may be divergent from the best interests of the entire organization. That's a big negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be able to make some examples uh, early on in your career where you clearly state and you clearly demonstrate that you're not like that, I think is critical. Interesting. So um, one of the things that the students are always interested in is is understanding kind of what qualities you look for when you're when you're picking leaders for the organizations that uh, you know sort of in, in sort of participants in the organizations that you lead and how you think about training people or mentoring people toward leadership roles. You know, generically, um, uh, Diane, there are three things that I think that are uh, critical to selecting and thinking about people. Um, one is obviously just competence in, in the role, you know, what, what people are going to be doing. The second thing is a, a sense of real ambition, that they are truly ambitious and they want to push things beyond maybe even the stated bounds. And the third one would be around a, a sense of integrity. Mm -hmm. Now, those are, are fairly personal and difficult things to come to a decision on, I find, in, in a single meeting with someone. So I'm often when we meet candidates at the foundation and, and people come in for positions, um, I'm usually in the mode, uh, at least at the first meeting, of um, 
you know, let's, let's try and put this person in the most positive uh, light possible. So in, in the convenings we have afterwards and people say, well, what did you think of this candidate? I'll be on the, the front end, you know, as the cheerleader and saying, I thought that was a fantastic candidate. They were enthusiastic. And it will often take uh, the diversity of people to sort of roll mm. me back and say, well, would they be a good fit in this regard or not? But, uh, and I also find that you need more than just um, a telephone conversation or a single half hour session mm -hmm. to come to some estimate on those types of criteria. Great, thank you. So maybe now we'll move a, a little bit to the, to the questions of global health. Um, so clearly you're leading um, an organization um, that has a major impact on uh, global health, on, on the direction of global health research in particular and, and implementation. And I'm wondering sort of how you think about the problems of global health, how you parse what the foundation's going to be involved in, and, and how you balance the various competing priorities. That was actually one of the principal challenges that, that I confronted um, when I started with, with Gates. We had a number of strong ideas about um, priorities uh, in individual areas. But we didn't have a, uh, an adequate, I thought, portfolio view of all the things that we were doing. So 100 different projects. We didn't have any way of adjudicating, is it better for us to invest in uh, improving the primary health care system in Lesotho, a fairly small country where we could make some impact, or is it better to invest in a novel TB vaccine, which has been so difficult to make? And those seem like such disparate items. How do you adjudicate across that sort of territory? So uh, yeah, I felt that we needed some framework uh, mm -hmm. of thinking about these things, and, and only as a guide, because the, uh, the confidence in precise estimates has to be somewhat guarded. So we started to think about just the common measures, um, things mm -hmm. like disability adjusted life years averted mm -hmm. for a particular intervention, which you can apply to an intervention, you could apply to a diagnostic, you could apply to a new vaccine. And then also building in, of course, because we live in this constrained world of resource, the cost effectiveness. So mm -hmm. how much would it cost? And we took as our measure bed nets for malaria, $100 per disability adjusted life year averted, and male surgical circumcision for reducing HIV transmission, which is actually cost saving. Mm -hmm. So we took two known things out there that almost everybody would agree are uh, useful, very useful mm -hmm. interventions. And then we put them across the rest of the portfolio and said, where do things fall out? And very quickly, um, you know, <laughs> some things did fall out. So, um, you know, and, and they were very positive projects in some ways, but we had to look at them very carefully. Uh, we looked at, for instance, um, where would a hookworm vaccine fall out in this mix of very big entities? A very interesting scientific project to get a hookworm vaccine, a huge uh, part of the world's population mm -hmm. in developing countries impacted by this. But it's not just a hookworm vaccine. You know, if we had something that was uh, totally curative, um, eliminated hookworm permanent, that'd be one thing. It was how would that vaccine be versus the very effective drug campaigns, the mass mm -hmm. drug uh, campaigns that people use with uh, very effective drugs. And it turns out actually not that much. Mm -hmm. So we had to take some actions like that on our portfolio. Right. Now, I think it, it's very interesting. And I think perhaps one of the other things to, to comment on is how you see global health evolving in the time that you've been involved at the Gates Foundation. So how do you see the approaches, the thinking about global health changing uh, as we speak? Uh, you know, I can give my own personal example from your ultimate bosses, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, when they uh, announced in 2007 in a meeting that they'd convened that they were calling for the eradication of malaria. And of course, there I was as a basic scientist saying, really, the eradication of malaria? We've tried this once. Um, does, it, does it really make sense? But I think that has led to a mm -hmm. paradigm shift in the field that, that we're at least thinking about how to eradicate malaria and what it would take. What are the various steps? And I'm wondering in terms of, uh, th so that was considered, at least in the malaria field, a very bold step at the time. And the question is, 
How do, how do you think global health thinking is evolving as we speak today? Are there such dramatic changes in other areas? No, Diane, I, I think actually you, you're really on uh, track um, with your comments over there. So to the extent that um, if one looks back over the last couple of decades uh, in the healthcare sector um, in general, but in global health in particular, um, there have been elements of pessimism that anything could be done because um, the infrastructure and the situation in many of the regions that we are most interested in would be so difficult to work in. Uh, or there would be sort of uh, millennial thinking about that's fantastic, we'll eradicate malaria in five years or we'll have you know, no, nobody will die from malaria um, by this year, actually. 2015. 2015. Right. That was a, that was a goal at one point. Um, so there was either this sort of fantastical thinking or there was extreme pessimism. And, and what I've seen is people now starting to roll up their sleeves and say, well, what are the ambitious goals we have? And, and Bill and Melinda have been really at the forefront of certainly challenging us in the foundation on, on those and uh, some of the, the global health community as well. But then going the next step of saying, and now what are the practical plans whereby you're going to actually execute on these ambitious goals? Eradication mm -hmm. of malaria, eradication of some of the other neglected tropical diseases, uh, getting the tools that we need for malaria eradication and mm -hmm. trying them out in some easier circumstances, but nobody with an idea that there is a credible plan whereby we will eradicate malaria in five years. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Interesting time for the fields. Um, yeah. So in, in terms of, <clears throat> let's move sort of to education and preparation, excuse me. Um, in terms of, from an educational standpoint, what's, what's your sense of what the, the global health, the public health expert is going to need in a decade? Is it going to be, or, or in two decades, is it the same kind of skills that we have now? Are there additional skills that people are going to need to solve these major problems? Well, we were just uh, chatting b before the session yeah, around uh, how multifunctional the problems have become. You know, if you mm -hmm. take the, the mantra that you have here from genes to the globe, um, that, that truly is the spectrum of where we're at. Mm -hmm. So that requires multifunctional disciplines. Now, it, difficult to expect any one person is going to master all of those. Mm -hmm. So that one has to think about a different type of education, I mean, an exposure to the complexity of the problems, and a sufficient understanding of the components that you can access and you can ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that is a new pedagogy that hasn't quite been worked out yet. Um, even within in the foundation ourselves, as we think about putting together these multifunctional teams, um, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. how, you know, how do you get people that have fundamentally different training, they have different way of viewing the problems, to work together on a single problem? It's, it's a challenge we face here, yeah. and, and certainly I think it's, it's one of the challenges that we've identified here at the T.H. Chan School of Public Health um, to, to really um, focus on, on training students. Uh, you know, Julio likes to refer to students as T-shaped. The ideal student is T-shaped. A deep knowledge, okay, okay. but <clears throat> uh, the T part, the connection, mm -hmm. having knowledge that allows you to interact in a, in a functional way with, um, with others who have different in-depth knowledge. And, I, and mm -hmm. I think that's it's a really interesting visual, but I think it's exactly what you're saying. You need people who are experts because without experts uh, you, won't, you won't be able to achieve what you need, but you need people who can understand the importance of the other parts of, uh, of disciplines and, and expertise that needs to be brought to a problem. No, exactly, and, and I would add, you, just from my own experience, there's a sort of a, a circuit diagram like understanding of the components and you may yeah. understand some genetics and some toxicology on the path. What was so helpful to me was um, the work which seemed completely tangential in um, mathematics and complex dynamical systems. Because uh, you know some understanding of how the non-linearities in a system actually can lead to behaviors which are not obvious or were not predicted uh, I think is something uh, which whenever you put these multifunctional groups together 
or you're looking at the systems that we're trying to impact in the world, which have got these components that are operating and interacting in nonlinear ways. So some uh, sensitivity to the dynamical nature of the world, mm -hmm. as opposed to just book learning of individual components, I think is important. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms, I think it's about time to open the questions to the audience. Um, so I don't want to take all of Dr. Mundell's time. So we'll, we'll allow uh, some uh, in the audience uh, to ask questions. We also have some questions that have come in via social media of some sort. So are there That's questions great. in the room? Or I'll start with one. All right. Um, so the, one of the questions that came in uh, from uh, students is, what can the nonprofit sector learn from big business? And you're an ideal person, I think, to answer that since you've had deep experience in both. That, I think that it goes both ways. I've learned a fantastic amount from uh, you know, the people, some of the people in the room over here and from uh, the partners that we've had in the nonprofit sector who've got a very different perspective. And in some ways, some of the problems are a little bit more complex. But certainly, I think that what I mentioned was <clears throat> this portfolio approach. Thinking about in, in the for-profit sector, of course, you've got some fairly simple measures of your portfolio. You can look at its value, its economic value. And things that you do to that portfolio are going to alter that, that economic value. Now, that, that can be, it sounds simple, but it can be a very difficult thing when you're projecting how valuable is this new drug going to be in eight years' time when there's a different uh, set ecosystem, different set of therapies that might be already out there, and there are many competitors that are going to have similar or going to have even more novel compounds. That projection has, you know, is a difficult one within that context. But th the idea that uh, you are matching your resources against a portfolio and trying to allocate against what is most productive in terms of the goals over there, which is to have the highest economic value and return on that portfolio, the, to us is to have the highest human return on our portfolio, mm -hmm. which we're now measuring by the, the, some of the numbers that, that I mentioned. Um, that has been a, a transferable type of insight. Mm -hmm. Question? Hi, thank you very much. I'm Julie O'Brien, uh, alum of the Kennedy School of mm -hmm. Government. Question for you on um, the, uh, the Ebola outbreak and just the, the spotlight that it put on the, the importance of health system strengthening. And can you talk a little bit about what the Gates Foundation's thinking about that right now and how you might be altering any of your approaches to broaden your approach to health system strengthening? You, you know, that, that was, there, there are many lessons uh, that are going to come out of Ebola and um, we'll get some of those breaking out at least over the next couple of months leading uh, up to even the G7 meeting that, that's going to happen in, in June. I think people are starting to think very hard. It's a little bit premature because, of course, that, that situation, that tragic situation is not yet over. So uh, one shouldn't encourage people to start thinking about uh, all these things before we've dealt with it. Um, w one immediate thing from our perspective, uh, you know, we initially had committed a, a fairly significant amount of acute funding into this, about 50 million, of which uh, probably it ended up being more than that, but um, was how the systems for response to emergencies like this, to the extent that they had already been set up, were not able to very rapidly and flexibly deploy funding, even mm -hmm. fairly small amounts of money. Um, there, there was a committee, a research committee, which was set up at WHO, and we needed to have that done very urgently. Um, and it was a question, would this go through some couple of months funding process just to set up an expert group that could get together and give us information on where we should go on the research agenda? Mm -hmm. And we were able to step in and, you know, within days, be able to fund that. So from, from our perspective and what I saw was the fungibility and the flexibility of our funding, we were able to fill some of the gaps in the system where there was funding in place, very large amounts of funding in place, but it was fairly rigid. So I think at a sort of a global system for emergency response, we need to think uh, more systematically about mm -hmm. how we actually have that 
interaction. Now, the healthcare situation in, in country, um, clearly all of the mechanisms whereby this uh, epidemic is being dealt with uh, could have been dealt with so much more effectively with even a modicum of improvement in those, those healthcare systems. And we know that some of the places, uh, Uganda or the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there have been uh, more frequent Ebola outbreaks, even though some of the infrastructure there may not be fantastic, have been able to certainly have been adequate to dealing with the problem. Uh, it, it just re-emphasizes for us that, you know, whatever we could do on the treatment side, let's say, and I think I'm pretty hopeful we're going to come up with mm. some effective therapies out of this uh, situation, whether it be the antibody or even drug therapies, and we'll see about a vaccine. But things that would need to be delivered by people in a decent care setting, uh, without that being in place, we can have you know, the antibody or the magic bullet drug, but being able to deliver that is going to be the final frontier and the obstacle. So I think that we are very focused on, on that now, and it's a bit of a wake-up call. Another question uh, that, that comes up, not just about global health, but, but it does come up about how the research you know, industry, how the, how the research infrastructure is funded in the U.S. And, and I think for many students and fellows now, they're looking at the NIH budget as being flat or even going down in real dollars. And that's really been the place that the vast majority of fundamental research in the United States and has been funded over since the the you know since the middle of the last century, and I, I think many of us see that that situation may be permanently changed. There's a, there's really a change, and I'm wondering how you, from the foundation side, think about that problem and what kinds of things uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation uh, can do to help. Um, you know, help advocate for additional government funding. I think the even with the vastness of the Gates Foundation, the, the federal government still, the research infrastructure and the research, the scientific infrastructure in the federal government is still, of course, much greater. Well, we are, you know, just generically advocates and huge believers in the role of public funding of basic research. Mm -hmm. I think what we can do and what we have been doing, in fact, we, we were just on, my team was on a call with uh, a senior team from the NIH just yesterday. Uh, we started up a process uh, last year after uh, Bill Gates gave a lecture at the NIH, uh, the Barnes Lecture, uh, of how we could better align what we were doing so there would be uh, complementarity and not redundancy. And it, it occurs in two areas. Mm -hmm. One was, uh, and this is in the global health area. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say that, you know, why exactly would the NIH be in global health? I think Ebola is a great example of right. why it actually is important uh, to be engaged in global health. But to the extent that we are, are two big funders, probably the two biggest funders of the global health research uh, agenda, uh, we had no notions of what our respective portfolios were and whether there was redundancy, whether we were potentially funding the same people. Uh, hopefully not for the same activities, but we didn't know that, and I mm -hmm. think that we have now a good sense of that. We had that process. The other thing is that, as much as we see the NIH funding, you know, long-term basic research, there is a, a certain category of research which is kind of the crazy stuff. <laughs> it's just somebody, uh, you know, a high school student, has a, a new idea for a um, maybe an, an iPhone app mm -hmm. that's going to be uh, revolutionary. There was such an example. Uh, who funds that? And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we designed our Grand Challenges Exploration, these $100,000 grants that you can get with a two-page application if you've got a great idea. And um, that is sort of the crazy stuff. And we've seen actually now some great examples of interesting things coming out of that. Mm -hmm. So that sort of complements the NIH, and that probably the NIH would, would not fund that. Exactly. Yes? So we have a Related question sent in from the online audience. Uh, how have you dealt with the challenges of unstable financial and funding environment at the foundation? And as you may know, many of our students are going to work in the nonprofit sector. So how would you suggest students going into the nonprofit sector think about funding challenges in their own organizations? Thank you. 
Well, you know, there clearly has been a constrained funding source for, for global health, uh, which has been tied up with the larger trends that we've talked about mm -hmm. over here. So I wouldn't say that global health was uniquely targeted, but it does seem that in some cases when people are considering you know, overseas direct investments and the like, that it, it comes up as in, in some countries and some settings as one of the first things that's suggested as might be uh, something that could be cut from, from, from the budgets. So we've seen our partners, and, and particularly this has impacted us through our partner organizations, the product development partners, for instance, but other partners as well, as their funding sources, their diversified funding sources have pretty much shrunk. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, we've become the major funders of organizations that used to have 50 plus percent of their funding from a diversity of sources. That's, that, that's a huge challenge um, for those organizations because we would like them to be independent and to have this diversity of funding. Uh, so it, it's necessitated a number of, of sort of hard discussions I in terms of, you know, is this entity viable? Do we go forward with this? Um, are there other ways that, that we could do this kind of work? Um, in terms of somebody going into the philanthropic or the not-for-profit sector now uh, with the funding constraints that exist, um, I, I wouldn't be totally pessimistic. I think that some of the uh, trends, particularly from philanthropy, and the way that we saw some philanthropists drawn into the Ebola crisis, mm -hmm. uh, you know, persons with tremendous personal wealth, who really, uh, you know, one of the first types of investments they've made uh, at this kind of level, that, that being very exciting. And I think that, that we just have to think of ways of translating some of that funding. It's always easy in some ways to get funding for an acute crisis that everybody knows and that is on the front pages of the newspaper. But how do we, uh, and this has been one of the things that I found most remarkable, we have crises uh, you know, which are of a greater dimension than Ebola going on every day in the countries in which we mm -hmm. work. How do we get the, this broader group of philanthropists uh, now to know about and actually to participate in that kind of funding. That's a vast untapped source of funding that I think may be leading on from Ebola and one of the lessons we've learned we can actually tap into. Thank you so much for coming and for your words of wisdom. One of the things that we appreciate tremendously about not least the Ebola crisis but the general question is capacity in developing countries. And one of the things the school takes pride in is that about a third of our students come from overseas increasingly from developing countries. There's money re for research. Uh, there's money for many other things. It is really difficult to get money for training in public mm -hmm. health and other forms of advanced biomedical science for people who are needed to provide leadership in developing countries. What's the perception of the foundation in where that capacity is going to come from? Barry, thanks for the question. It, it is a difficult question, and, and we've looked at this quite hard, because there's the element of training of people from developing countries, uh, and that is absolutely critical. There's also the element of developing an infrastructure in those countries so that the trained people will have a good home to, to return to and will be excited to go back and work in their countries and have the kinds of opportunities that they would like over there. And, and I've been very focused on, and at least in the global health perspective, focused on that aspect of the training question. So what happens in some ways after training? And I think that would also enrich the pool of people who, who are really applicants for being trained. Um, a couple of things are happening on that front, though. Uh, and because I think everybody is acutely aware of that issue. Uh, with the Wellcome Trust and uh, with um, the British government, we've established this initiative around uh, accelerating excellence in science in Africa, where we want to get away from the paradigm of uh, people outside of Africa making grants or selecting African scientists for funding, mm -hmm. and whereby we would have an entity like the African Academy of Sciences have a fund which they can use to select themselves African scientists for training and for funding. I think there have been other initiatives uh, just in, in South Africa. You know, there's be, there was a, um, 
a big initiative uh, to reform the Medical Research Council there and change its structure and make it a much more efficient organization. And we were able to step in and provide some funding, which was then matched by the Ministry of Finance. And that's always the trick because uh, within countries, there's the Ministry of Health or the Ministry of Science. They often don't have a lot of money. The Ministry of Finance, on the other hand, does. So that comes down to marshalling the, the economic arguments of the benefits for African countries to allocate a, what for them is a significant proportion of their budget to science and to science training. David. David. Uh, David Hunter, TH Chan School. Uh, so Trevor, I'm sure you saw the uh, op-ed piece that Bill Gates wrote in the New York Times recently in the Perspective of the New England Journal, mm -hmm. just pointing out how ill-prepared we are in terms of pandemic preparedness. And obviously stimulated by Ebola, um, we can imagine more effective health systems would have provided earlier warning, but they still probably in that setting would have needed substantial external help. Um, but who knew that Médecins Sans Frontières was the world's first responders or ambulance brigade? And it seemed like there was a call for something like that that would be kind of transnational, maybe have certain powers beyond the international health regulations. But of course, there are delicate issues of nav national sovereignty, etc. cetera. Um, when the next pandemic comes, are we going to be better prepared than we've been for past pandemics? I, I'm optimistic, actually, that we will be. Um, I only thing I worry about is that that may take some years to put all the structures in place because we're talking about some fairly substantial changes to the way that global health is is governed and these structures of uh, type of task force that could be maintained and could be parachuted into these urgent areas will take a while to construct and to train. Um, I would be worried about what happens if we have a you know, an influenza epidemic uh, in the next shorter while before this, these structures are in place. Um, so there is that issue. I do think that there are a couple of things in the background that I've certainly focused on, uh, and this comes around to national sovereignty. Some of the critical decisions that are taken in terms of interventions that are deployed and should be deployed, because as you saw with Ebola, there, were a, there was a hue and cry about a dozen different claim to be effective interventions that should be deployed urgently. And in fact, that were deployed in Ebola patients outside of the impacted countries very readily. Who adjudicates that in the countries? And uh, to the extent, um, do we have capacity in the ministries of health, in the regulatory systems in those countries to be able to make that adjudication? Because you can make that adjudication in Geneva, um, but in some ways, uh, it doesn't necessarily have impact in a country which is very distant from Geneva in terms of driving action, even though uh, the group in Geneva is probably uh, empowered in terms of uh, the World Health Association legislation and also has the scientific capability to make some of the determinations. So I think we have to look very carefully at the regulatory systems in uh, <coughs> the countries that may be impacted in, in this regard. Uh, with the example of these three countries. And also some of the efforts towards harmonized regulatory systems that might be able to aggregate. Very difficult to see that we could have an FDA in every country in Africa anytime soon. But can we have regional harmonized regulatory bodies which would have considerable capability and ability in such a crisis and in future to be able to do that? In East Africa, East African harmonized region already is a great example of that. And I think that there's talk now about ECOWAS in West Africa also going in that direction. So we are very supportive of that, that harmonization from the perspective that we can then have very good local decision making that will drive action. I think that, that brings us to this, this broader question. It, it's not just Ebola that doesn't respect borders, but it's, you know, every infectious disease is malaria. The disease that I work on not only doesn't respect borders, but there are mosquitoes that can carry it across borders or people carrying it across borders. So in general, do you see a shift in global governance of, of disease, of health? Is how, How's that tension going to work? And what is, 
what role do organizations like the Gates Foundation play both in developing the thinking but also subsequently in the implementation of this, these, this kind of idea? I do see this evolution, Diane, and I think that the World Health Organization, which is really a normative organization, plays a critical role in setting forward you know, rational policies. But translating them into action requires something which is much more local. So either it is capacity within, directly within country in the Ministry of Health, and as I've said, that to have that same level of capacity in many, many countries is a tall order. We'll get there eventually, but mm -hmm. that take a long time. In the interim, is there this middle layer that we can put in place where we have regional significant organizations which can translate the types of policies that uh, the World Health Organization would put forward into the relevant regional terms mm -hmm. and reference? Good. So um, one of the things that we've talked about this morning is this idea of uh, the Gates Foundation has partnerships with many organizations. Uh, and I'm wondering if you might comment on sort of your experience with partnerships, what you think works, what doesn't work, uh, what kinds of uh, issues come up. They, uh, that, that would be a, a long list, but let's try and uh, prioritize on some of the, the, okay. the items over here. You know, one I think would just be uh, people would need to understand our philosophy. So as much as we've grown as an organization in terms of our actual organizational size tremendously over our 15 years now, we are heading towards a steady state of you know, about 1,500 people uh, from the few people who started in um, Bill Gates Sr.'s basement. So that's a, that's a tremendous increase. But they spread across many different programs, mm -hmm. including the US programs and agriculture and, and other things. Nevertheless, that, that is a very small group to execute the uh, portfolio that we participate in. It's not everything that we own in that portfolio. We, we try yeah. and support the entire global health portfolio. That's a very small group. So we are always going to be an organization that is going to mostly operate through partners. So I think that there needs mm -hmm. to be that, that understanding. Uh, because there's always the sense, particularly with the partners where we are, say, the majority funder, uh, to what extent do we not get into the negative dynamic of, uh, as a majority funder, do we have too mm -hmm. much um, stake in, in where that entity is going and the decisions they're making? And to what extent have we built the capabilities for them to really be independent and effective mm -hmm. in the world? That's our best outcome. So that's, a, uh, I think, a recurrent dialogue with our partners Mm -hmm. is how do we encourage their independent action based on good capabilities mm -hmm. as opposed to, say, us convening expert groups and somehow being the funnel for expert mm -hmm. advice going out to the, to the global health world. Um, you know, with other partners, it's, it's interesting to me. We only sometimes need one effective champion in a partner organization. And we can think of some of the organizations we work with as difficult to change, moving slowly. But all it takes is one champion and uh, an effective person who has grown up in that organization and knows how to play the wheels of power over there to just cut through things. You know, we've seen through this in uh, the regulatory reform, the pre-qualification and the World Health Organization, which has really, in the last you know, 18 months, undergone a sea change in terms of uh, a, a much more rational and efficient system of mm -hmm. putting products into the global health space. And it's come about from, uh, you know, one great partner we had within the organization who took this up and uh, was championed by the uh, Director General. So, in, in fact, I think you're about to have a forum in Seattle um, uh, with your global partners. And does that have a theme? You, I understand you do this every year. Right. We're fortunate enough to be able to have this um, forum, which we call our Partners Forum. And it's had various names, Product Development Partners Forum. Uh, this year, it's a global forum because it truly cuts across not just folks involved in product development, but a, a vast array of people. It'll be 800 to 1,000 people you know, who are deeply involved in global health, from government ministers to uh, the World Health Organization. All of our product development partners will be there. 
So it's a tremendous convening to actually have in most of the values in the side meetings when you can pull groups together and uh, come to, to some types of conclusions. You know, one of the themes that, that we've been working on, so how do we pull that group together? How do, how do we um, put out one of the directions that we're heading in? Mm -hmm. And we come back to this recurrent thorny issue of data and what do we do with this? We've been a big source of uh, the generation of healthcare data, uh, but we've certainly not solved the problem of the fact that that data is siloed. It's an archipelago of data out there, of little data islands that persist for certain periods of time and there's no integration around that. So in the, to the extent that I see data only as useful to the, that it leads to actions and decisions, that being the only use of generating data. But in some ways, going directly from primary data in the field to action and decisions, which may be government policies, is too big a step. So we need an integrative layer, we need a model in between which distills the data in some rational way, whether it is a dynamical model or it is a geospatial map of malaria incidence and, and prevalence and strains even mm -hmm. will be, be important. There needs to be this um, synthetic layer in between before you can easily go to a health ministry and say, look, we've got this data, this is what it's telling us, let, let me show you what it's like. And that's a little bit ar around uh, what we're going to talk about at, at the session, at least for part of the session. And we were thinking about ways of you know, bringing this back to in individual people. And we were thinking of the narrative of a woman who 15 years ago in an African village gave birth to a young girl. And you know, what would the healthcare system elements be that she confronted, not being seen by the healthcare system and at home delivery, mm -hmm. What would her daughter's future be in 15 years' time? And that's mm -hmm. the sort of narrative arc. We're thinking about in that future world, it's almost an intentional envisioning of the future. In the 15-year future, what would we like her daughter to be able to access when she herself gives delivery in 15 years' time? Mm -hmm. Marcia? I want to follow up on a topic that you just mentioned. So you have the primary data and then you would like to create this layer that digests the data and then can inform. So some countries are not even fortunate to have the primary data. So you don't have a chance to come up with this layer, just the data are not there. Is the foundation doing something towards that now or is planning to do in the near future to actually address this major need of having the primary data to then have something else to inform policy? Yes, yes, very, no, very definitely yes, because as much as we've committed to the, the synthetic layer, I completely agree with you that, in that that is uh, really guesswork uh, and a huge extrapolation. If you looked at the confidence bounds on our estimates, they're drawn from neighboring countries and neighboring regions even. So we really do not know the state exactly in every province of, you know, uh, DRC, for instance, of where there's sleeping sickness. African trypanosomiasis. Um, and we need to invest in that. And, and we're looking at a, at a system whereby each of the regions, the sig significant regions, would at minimally have a reference center, center of excellence, that uh, would be able to do sophisticated cross-pathogen surveillance, collecting of primary data from a sufficient uh, sampling pool that it would now be representative of that region. To the extent, could that be a network of, uh, you know, 50 of these reference centers? That's, that's a lot. I think it's going to have to be less than that. So we're going to have to integrate this, this notion. And we've had some fairly advanced discussions on this with the existing networks. It's not to say that there are no networks. But it happens to be that there are not networks which are great in exactly the places where we don't have the data. So our uh, drive over here would be not to be redundant with the existing networks, but actually to think about putting these reference centers exactly mm -hmm. in the regions and countries where we have the greatest difficulty in getting good data. All right. I think we have time for one last short question, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Alex. I am actually from the other side of Africa. I'm from Tunisia. And um, in fact, you have a medical school. So, so today, we, with the Gates Foundation work with HME, um, we, they paved the way to understand that the disease 
are not following the trend that global health actors put in their agenda. Um, as, a, as an example, actually, for instance, in my country, uh, for women, the, the highest rate of DALI is related to depression. And unfortunately, the problem that the healthcare system is not actually prepared to do that and to handle this situation. And it's not also prepared from the global health perspective, where actors are not really following that path. They're, they're more interested about infectious disease, HIV, AIDS, which is still an important issue. Um, so my question is, how the Gates Foundation now perceive that movement? And, and who are the actors who may probably be able to solve the issues on the short midterm? Uh, and what kind of investment is actually the Gates Foundation would put probably in the next few years or so? Well, we've certainly been very significant supporters of this ability to disaggregate the total burden of disease into its components, the global burden of disease effort. Um, unfortunately, the circumstance that you speak to and the irrationality of healthcare allocation happens uh, as much almost in the developed countries as it does in developing countries. Uh, so, you know, we have a lot to fix. It's a global problem to fix and uh, n not such an easy one. We often get the question more in terms of why would we have a continuing focus on infectious disease when we know that non-communicable diseases are now rising as a very major element of the disease burden even in developing countries. Um, I think that for now at least, when we look at the poorest countries in the world, it remains the case as much as uh, there is an emerging non-communicable disease burden over there. Infectious disease is a huge and unsolved problem for them. So we, we more have a, a sense right now that we need to fix the problem we started with in the most um, countries most lacking in infrastructure first. Um, when we have you know, got to a certain point in that, then we would have to come back to this, this issue of a more rational allocation uh, to the entities, mental health is, is a huge problem. It comes up in all the uh, lists and all the tables very high. Uh, we do have to think about you know, whether we have effective interventions, and some of them are very cost intense, intensive in terms of infrastructure. I, I am so, going to have to yeah. interrupt because of time. I'm sorry. We're going to ask you to uh, perhaps a couple of takeaway messages for the group, and then we'll be able to conclude. Thanks, Diane. No. And, and you can see that that is a question on yeah. priorities, which yeah. uh, is close to yeah. uh, our mission and, and our heart. Um, but you know, when I just look at my trajectory over here and in terms of um, what I see across the, the world in terms of the many global health groups that I meet with and actually many of the students that I, I love to meet with, like yourselves, uh, the only thing that I can think about is that I was crazy not to have done what I'm doing now 20 years ago. So uh, in terms of whether this is a positive world to enter into or it's something on a decline, to get into global health from the perspective of the nonprofit sector, um, I think is the most satisfying career you can ever imagine in any of the healthcare space. And uh, it dwarfs anything that I conceived could be done before it's got, if you like, complex problems. It's got every dimension of a complex problem. So I can only encourage you to, in some ways, uh, look beyond, as I think it is rational to do, some of these issues we raised around the immediate funding crisis. Um, there is such a desperation out there, and I see such an emerging global consensus that we should actually do something about this, and we should do something now and not have this wait for another generation that uh, I do believe will transcend that funding crisis, whether it be by philanthropists or other means. So you know, I would focus in terms of what you're thinking about um, developing your big ideas, because that's part of the ambition, and you know, putting yourselves in, uh, in front of organizations that you want to be with and do work that uh, will give you an incredible legacy. Cool. Thank you very much, Dr. Wendell. <laughs> With that, um, I remind everybody that World Malaria Day is coming up in two weeks. And uh, 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 just to remind, uh, I think, everybody of the advances made and the declaration by Bill and Melinda Gates has 
there has been, as a result of that, I think, a, a focus on applying the tools that we have now and finding the new tools. This is an example of how an organization like the Gates Foundation, under the leadership we've seen here, can actually change the world. So I agree, it's a very exciting time to be in the field and we really appreciate you coming to visit. Great, thank you.